The following is a conversation with Dr. Mary Graybar. This conversation is going to be really insightful for those who care about history, and particularly American history, slavery, and the founding of America itself. For those who don't know, 1619 was the first year where the first Africans were brought to America by European settlers. And there is a contention and argument going on that that is the year that should be replaced with the original founding of America instead of 1776, which it currently is known as when the Declaration of Independence was originally issued. So because the claim that that's when the first Africans arrived and apparently instead built the real wealth of America instead of the founding fathers being the original uh, ones being celebrated for the founding of America. Now, what I speak about with Dr. Graybar is basically there's a teaching of American history that's been fractured with many believing that American history or America in general is very deeply evil uh, from its foundation. And so I have Mary to come on and talk about how the idea that America is based on only uh, discrimination, racism, and sexism, bigotry is maybe there's another side to it. Maybe what we know about slavery, what we know about American history is not all it seems to be. So if this is a topic that interests you, you should really enjoy my conversation with Dr. Mary Graybar. We, we got a lot to talk about. Let's let's see where we can go. You wrote uh, this this new book, um, and I always wonder with authors like, what was the main compelling drive for you to write this book? Like, why on this topic? Like, why did it strike a chord with you, and why do you think people should care more about it? Yeah, well, that's a great question, and it goes back to my days uh, as a college professor uh, back before I was canceled in 2013, basically. Um, I was writing about the corruption of education and indoctrination that I was seeing in the college freshmen and sophomores that were coming into my classes, and they were complaining, and I was seeing it in my, among my colleagues. And I noticed these radicals from the 1960s, uh, like Bill Ayers and Howard Zinn, were teaching and having tremendous influence. And I started writing about them. And in 2019, two years ago, I published my book on debunking Howard Zinn, which is a Marxist uh, version of American history, falsified. And then a couple years later, I heard about the 1619 Project, and, you know, I thought things couldn't be much worse than Howard Zinn, and I read it, and I was appalled. I had been writing, I have been working on a biography of the late cons Black conservative journalist George Schuyler, uh, who lived from 1895 to 1977, so I had some understanding of Black history. I've done a lot of research in it. And I could see that the 1619 Project was just full of falsehoods and gaps. And I was further appalled to know that before the ink had even dried on the covers, these uh, it was being uh, slipped into classrooms ac across the country with quizlets, they called them, you know, a set of quizzes, uh, lesson plans, discussion questions. And I was appalled that second graders are being taught this poisonous, toxic version of American history. Okay, we, this is what we want to get into, just to bring some context around this, because I know you've talked about this so much, right? But to bring context, 1619, apparently being known as the year, instead of 1776, where the first Africans were brought uh, to America as slaves. And I would love you to dive into a little bit into the for and against this argument that America was founded on the backs of slaves, for and against, you know, because I think it's, let's, let's try and argue both sides, but then come to the point of, okay, where does this evidence come from? Why is it factual or why is it false? Okay, well, I would be the first um, to, uh, you know, refuse uh, or, or deny the contributions of African Americans to American society, to American uh, economics, um, to their labor, their innovations, the culture. Um, we cannot deny that. Totally. Uh, it, they, 
they are a part of our history. They're American. Um, that was the claim that George Schuyler made, and they uh, have, you know, every claim on the American heritage and to Americanism. And that was once the prevailing view of blacks in this country in the early 20th century. So I would not deny that at all. And as a matter of fact, I believe that, you know, we need to continue investigating black history for the longest time. It was not known to all Americans and all uh, American students, but we need an honest history. So though those uh, first Africans did arrive in 1619, sometime in the latter part of August, um, we don't know exactly how many. The records are sketchy. They estimate between 20 and 30. We don't know their status exactly. Historians uh, are still debating that. Were they indentured servants or were they immediately slaves? Or were they indentures, but having a longer indenture than, say, the English, who typically uh, had to work for seven years to pay their passage? So, um, and did they found this country um, as the 1619 Project uh, presents or tries to push this idea? No, they did not. As uh, they did, had nothing to do with the founding documents, with the philosophy. They weren't allowed, quite, quite frankly. And um, so, the the principles upon which this country was built was, um, you know, on the ideas of the founders, as traditionally understood. Uh, the the men, the white men, prop, mostly property white men who, you know, came up with the Declaration of Independence, the state constitutions, the American Constitution, and so forth. So I make that distinction there. However, the 1619 Project advances a Marxist perspective, which is that the foundation is simply material, that the labor of the slaves made this country and then the protest movements later all undertaken without the help of any white people as that they claim which is completely false provided the moral guidance for uh you know the democracy that we have today what which of course according to the standards of the 1619 project uh is still um it's still not free. It still needs work. We still need to adopt the policies of the far left and of the Democratic Party. Okay. Now, if to back up a little bit, because there's a nice little summary there, what is, what level of evidence do we have that people claim that when blacks came to America, they were immediately slaves? Uh, what evidence do we have for that, what's the ambiguity of that? And what is an indentured servant as well? Okay, well, an indentured servant was someone, uh, uh, English person um, who was poor, had no prospects and wanted to come to the new world, uh, basically starving. Sometimes they were children rounded off the streets, orphans the poor, and they came here and, and in exchange for their passage, which took months, a lot of them did not survive the ocean voyage, uh, they had an agreement, and they were like servants, uh, they, while well, they were, they were, um, they, they, they were not free, they could not marry in that time period, generally seven years, they had to have permission of their masters to travel any place. Um, so they had very few rights. And so it was a state of servitude. And um, and, and remind me of the, of the second question now. Uh, yeah, so just the off. evidence of, that's great, thank you for explaining that. And then now the evidence of like, okay, how do we really know? Because it's so long ago, how do we really know uh, the validity to how many of them 
were indentured servitudes, slaves, etc. Okay, well that yeah, that is a good question. We do know that the first legal uh, case, the precedent for slavery was set in 1654. So uh, they first arrived in 1619. Now the 1619 project says that these Africans came here and bam, we had slavery. Right. And ever since that year, yep. uh, they have been exploited. Well, that's not the case. Um, you know, the the ship, uh, the, the white lion that arrived with these Africans took the people here by surprise. They didn't know what to do with them. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, the captain needed food. And so in exchange for the food, uh, the settlers here got these Africans. Um, and so th it was very ambiguous about their status and slavery as an institution here was not a really codified until the late 17th century. So the first case uh, in a court that came about was actually by one of those original Africans by the name of Anthony Johnson. Now, he had been enslaved, they think, and he was married. Uh, he got married, and then he, some, he won his freedom. Well, he won his freedom. The, one of the first things he did was he got slaves of his own. And uh, one and his slave, he maintained he was a slave, by the name of John Kaser, sued for his freedom. He said, no, he was an indenture. And if seven years are up, I want my freedom. And the judge sided with Anthony Johnson and said, no, this man is your slave for life. And that was the first case that was established. So ironically, it was not a white right. person that, that established yeah. it, right? And, um, and of course, as time went on, it became racialized. Uh, of course, you know, whites could not be enslaved. That became law. And, and generally, the institution became more and more accepted. So, uh, but it did not start off, you know, as the 1619 Project claims with immediately they were slaves and were, you know, worked and had no rights, no rights to property or anything like that. That was not the case. Uh, this is a, like a really, I think, important point of the conversation that's almost never talked about. Like when I heard you originally say this on one of your podcasts, I was like, wait, one, blacks owned slaves as well. And number two, you're saying potentially the first record of a legal case f about this was a black man owning another uh, black man as a slave. And so this really, I think, throws into question like, well, the education system to which we've been taught uh, across the world on, on history, because I'm fascinated with history. That's why I'm like, I want to have this conversation with you. It's like, seems to be, I don't know, not at least told the whole truthful story. There seems to be a narrative that's been sold instead. And so I wonder, look, what are the, I don't know, like, what do we do about that? What are the consequences to this permeating a worldwide education system, particularly in America? Well, the consequences are that, that children, literally children, get this view that only white people own slaves right. or wanted to own slaves, and all black people were essentially victims. And so it furthers... Uh, you know, uh, critical race theory, this idea that we are, um, we are defined by our racial groups, uh, by our, you know, the, the group that we're in. And so it inspires this suspicion and this hatred, this false view of history, and it presents all whites as being uh, tarred by this mm. sin that they call it, uh, you know, and, and of course that's a misnomer, you know, of original sin uh, of slavery and that blacks were victims and had to, 
show white people how to really be um, fair and democratic and so forth. And so that is the purpose of it. I was at a conference of the Organization of American Historians, and I relate this incident in uh, debunking the 1619 Project, where they were discussing teaching about slavery, and it was all a very emotional exercise. Right. And so they were giving this teacher workshop for, for high school students, and this teacher, this education professor, said, well, what I do is I try to reenact how the weight the white slave owner would take a pregnant slave, uh, have her lie face down in this special contraption where her belly wouldn't be hurt, that, you know, the, the baby wouldn't be hurt, and he'd whip her. And, you know, so it's all very emotional. And, of course, you know, that, you know, there, were, there was cruelty, um, no doubt about that. But there was a teacher there who raised her hand during the questions session and said, well, you know, um, what about the fact that only 5% of the slaves who made the transatlantic voyage from Africa uh, came here to the colonies or the United States, only 5%. And she was told, she said, don't bring that up in class. Don't tell your students that. So, you know, if you're going to speak about the horrors you also need to talk about the actual facts, the statistics. And if you do speak about those horrors, well, it wasn't only white people committing those horrors. It was everyone. So every, we're all human. Yeah. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, people have, have done cruel things um, regardless of race. And it doesn't make it, uh, I just want to clarify, when we're not trying to uh, affirm that it makes it right or righter, right, morally. But I think the conversation at least brings into perspective that it, perhaps the judgment shouldn't be, or persecution shouldn't just be on one group of people. And I would like to kind of illuminate that idea by putting into perspective, Mary, can you talk about around the 1600s, 1700s, what was the history of slavery around the world? Like, like, tell me and us, like, the general uh, world view and cultural uh, approach to slavery then. Okay, well, the vast majority of the world's population was in some form of servitude. Slavery in 1776 was in existence everywhere except for Antarctica and Western Europe. And of course, the Western European nations had their colonies where they had slaves. So you had slavery, um, serfdom in Russia, uh, the uh, native tribes here in America had slaves, five, over 500 uh, indigenous tribes, Eskimos had slaves, uh, the Africans had slaves. Um, it was a commonly accepted thing. That's what they did when uh, they had prisoners of war, they enslaved them. It has been a worldwide institution since time imm immemorial. It's been accepted and legitimized by all the major religions and it has been practiced on white people. White people were enslaved. Uh, the Muslims, you know, came up as far as, you know, where I was born in Slovenia, in, you know, which was part of Yugoslavia and, and, you know, did raids. And so it has crossed racial lines through history, geographic lines, religious lines, and, uh, you know, almost all peoples who have been vulnerable in some way or another through militarily or economically have been enslaved. People used to sell themselves into slavery because they couldn't eat, that they, you know, they were starving. So this notion that's, that somehow, you know, America uniquely uh, exploited a group of people is completely false, but that's the way 
the 1619 Project presents it. And especially if you are a young student, you have not heard this other view from anywhere else, you are inclined to believe it. And then you're only seeing potentially one side of a conversation, right? But this side, I mean, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, right? And I'm someone who like looks into history. So I think that's why these conversations are so important because we want to be able to conversate and talk about all of the different arguments. But what is the, I was curious, what's the earliest record of servitude or slavery? Do, like, do we know, do we have any like accurate evidence around that? Like, do you know? Well, it's in the Bible, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, the Jews were enslaved. It goes back to, to the Babylonians. I mean, um, right. I, I, you know, prob I, I, I mean, I don't have an exact date, but probably from the time, you know, a uh, man walked upright, <laughs> you know, uh, people, people were enslaved. I mean, it goes back to primitive societies. Uh, that's what they did, you know, after a battle, uh, they, they would enslave others. So it, you, you can't, for as long as we know about history, as far back as history goes, uh, you know, to, to our origins, we have had slavery that we can't even say, you know, it started in one place. Mm -hmm. it, it's just been something that has been practiced. And, you know, this notion of freedom and equality. Yeah, that's new. That, that is new. In yeah. world history, that is new. That's radical. Yeah. I mean, that's, see, if you just took your little snippet and put that up, like it would get taken out of context. But that is radical in the sense of like thousands of years of history, right? If you took uh, the average individual a thousand years ago and they saw what was happening now with non-slavery, they were, well, what, do you, what do you mean freedom, liberty? What is that, right? And so I think that's really important. Can we talk about some of the, like the, appreciate the, the moral, social norm was considerably different hundreds of thousands of years ago, yet we judge history by our current social ideals and morals and ethics i don't know that doesn't seem as logical as possible i don't know yeah yeah that, that that's a great point um you know uh, uh one of these buzz phrases or buzzwords is you know in, in terms of you know the kind of history that's taught is your lived history okay right what is your experience sure and generally that is valued among certain groups. So uh, history suffers from presentism. You know, we apply our own standards to what was going on hundreds of years ago. But if you take someone like Thomas Jefferson, and if you try to imagine yourself in his place, mm -hmm. his earliest memory from when he was two or three years old was being carried on horseback by a trusted slave. Like, okay, this is the world he was born into. Yeah. He was, you know, his, his father, um, Peter Jefferson, was a surveyor and a land speculator. He did well. They had plantations. And, and he, this, this, this was his world. There wasn't much else. You didn't have you know, this idea that you can go out and hire farm laborers. Um, and it's very complicated. And I go into it in my book. Um, you know, I talk about how, how difficult it was to even free a slave at the time when it was such an accepted institution. And Jefferson himself could have run into a black slave owner you know, because they were around in Virginia in the 18th and early 19th century. So, so, so what do you do? This is the economic system, right? right? And, and take it into perspective. If I, if I go out and I buy something in the store and it's made in China, what about those, uh, you know, slave laborers in China that have produced 
the things that I buy or this computer that I'm using right now, right? Um, what about child laborers? You, as it, I try not to, I, you know, I, I remember the day back, you know, when Walmart, this was decades ago, they used to carry products that, that probably were labeled made in the USA. Right. <laughs> now, now you have to go online, right, to a specialized store, but you need these products. And, but, and this is the economy and you have to survive, right? You, you try to do the best you can, but you can't completely live apart from the system. Right. And, um, you know, and Jefferson, you know, as a statesman, as a leader, he, uh, you know, a, a, as a young man, he was idealistic, but he quickly saw the political realities. And he saw that sometimes if you are not careful in what you say or try to do as a political leader, you could actually make things worse for the people you're trying to help. So, so that was his life experience. Uh, and I think what we need to do, you know, without saying, hey, slavery was great, because we would never say that, right. but to say, this was a different world, but let's try to understand that world. And let's see what took place to get to the year 2021, right, where we have civil rights laws and we, um, you know, actually here have preferences, you know, racial preferences and other group preferences. So let's understand it. You know, let's look at, you know, um, the limitations that human beings have right, in, in terms of their own times and, and what they can do, the world that they live in, and let's see how they change over the course of their life. Um, and let's see, you know, maybe, you know, we would not think that they made great progress or did great things according to our standards. But if we look at their circumstances, the choices they were given, mm -hmm. we can maybe appreciate what they did do more. Right, like there was some utility to owning slaves. That that like there could have been some usefulness to improving their own livelihood at the time. While we don't deem that morally acceptable now, or mostly useful now, I think people really value independence. Like the whole value system as a human being is really, uh, I think, changed and evolved through modern civilization. Comfort seems to breed um, more flexibility uh, in a way. And so I wonder to keep deploying more, com at least a bit of perspective or c even compassion to their circumstances. What what could have been the utility? Like if you were to really put themselves in, the, in, in their shoes, like what is the utility to slaves or slave owning and, and servitude that was useful at that time that helped solve a problem? Well, there was... You know, there were also costs involved in, in having slaves. Um, you know, you had a, um, you know, a sure source of labor, right? And so if you're raising crops, you want to make sure you have those people there. Um, certainly, it, you know, I think economically, it would make more sense to have slaves, you would have more of a profit than having, say, indentures. And an indenture was uh, dying out, you know, that practice because, you know, the white settlers were coming in and getting land. Um, but there were also responsibilities tied to slavery. You, uh, if you were someone who really did care about them as Thomas Jefferson did, you would make sure that they were cared for in their old age when they were sick. You were uh, given the responsibility of feeding them, taking care of their medical needs and so forth. Um, there's a little story that I include about Jefferson. Um, 
this young man named Edward Coles, who was secretary to James Madison, and Jefferson was 71 years old and basically retired. And Edward Coles was 27 years old, and he really hated the idea of slavery, even though he inherited slaves. Thomas Jefferson, of course, inherited slaves, and he also had to take care of his mother's property and her slaves after his father died at the age of 14. But Edward Coles, a Virginian, also is just given these slaves. I mean, you know, think about yourself. What would you do? Here, here you are, you have these slaves. You mm -hmm. don't like that fact, but someone needs to take care of them. Okay. You can't just let, set them free. The law in Virginia at the time was they had to go out to another, they had to leave Virginia. Well, do you just like take them to the border and say, here, fend for yourself, right? So Edward Coles writes to Thomas Jefferson and he says, you know, do something, you know, even though Thomas Jefferson throughout his life, you know, in his own quiet way has tried to think of, of, of solutions to this, to just end it peacefully. Um, and Edward Coles, um, you know, is a young man, and uh, but it takes him five years even to leave Virginia. He gets a job as a registrar in uh, the territory of Illinois, and he moves there. But as he moves there, he has to make provisions for two old slave women to be taken care of for, you know, to the end of their days. He... Um, brings along two slave families, buys them each 160 acres to establish themselves in Illinois, takes and buys one young mother's, she, I think she had four or five children, buys the father of her children, her husband, I guess it was, who is still a slave and settles them in um, Missouri. Now he had the money to do this, but he was being sued. Um, these these freed slaves were being harassed. There were claims being made on their land, um, and you know he became governor of Illinois. But he ended up going back to Philadelphia, and uh, he married a wealthy woman, so he didn't have to worry about you know this, and uh, became a, a supporter of the Colonization Society because he thought. Well, you know, if we can, um, you know, have this place in Africa, they can go back to their own, they thought of it as their homeland, and they can be free of harassment and so forth. So there, there are incredible complications and restrictions on what, what people could do who were born into, the, into that situation. Yeah, and I think putting into perspective that it literally was law, and it doesn't mean law is always right. It just means there's a lot of pressure uh, on you that this is the social and political norm. Um, and I just, I just don't think we appreciate that. Uh, now we judge it very harshly, but I love being able to argue both sides like we're doing here. Um, traditionally, like Thomas Jefferson, uh, have you seen the show Hamilton? No, I haven't. <laughs> okay, because obviously that talks about the founding fathers of America um, through through a play. Um, and so... These founding fathers and Thomas Jefferson, they're painted in certain ways. Like, what's the tra the traditional kind of uh, perspective on Jefferson uh, as a as a slave owner? Well, if you read the textbooks, and I, I've gone into a couple of the textbooks in debunking the 1619 Project, yep. uh, he is presented as this cruel slave owner. And, of course, you've probably heard this controversy about whether or not he was, he was the father of Sally Hemings' children, Sally Hemings being one of his slaves, um, actually the half-sister of his wife who died young. Um, that has not been proven. Uh, there were DNA tests, and it, it was concluded that a number of the Jefferson men had uh, could have been, you know, was the father, but they couldn't pin it down. And the historians, a, a group of historians, got together about thirteen of them and concluded that it, you know, it might have been his younger brother who used to associate with the slaves, and you know, 
Uh, and, you know, maybe he fathered one. It was likely he fathered one of her six children. Well, the textbooks repeat this uh, speculation that Thomas Jefferson, you know, uh, fathered all her children. And of course, you know, he raped her because she wasn't free. And so they present him this way. Uh, they say that he had these lavish parties at Monticello while he tried to come off as just being, you know, your average person in the White House when he was president. And so, um, so there's this very, uh, very uh, negative perspective of Jefferson. He's a hypocrite for having written the Declaration of Independence and ho owning slaves. Um, but it's presented in isolation without the complications as if, um, you know, he could have just, you know, said, okay, well now you can just leave and get a job someplace <laughs> as if it were, you know, the 21st century. Okay. So clearly there seems to be some type of disconnect between, or even ambiguity, like this history is, uh, kind of, well, how, let's, let's go this, you know, the, when we make claims, we, we has a hierarchy of evidence, right? And I wonder for these claims for and against, uh, slavery and the, you know, uh, these many of the founders like Thomas Jefferson, whether how much they persecuted slaves or, or did not, you know, what level of evidence are we relying on? Are these like journals from people? Are these, uh, like actual governmental records? Like where do you personally get a lot of your evidence to back up your own claims and refute some of these claims like Hannah Jones make? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a farm book where he recorded uh, what he was doing as a, a planter. He had visitors come over, these French noblemen. They wrote about how he treated the slaves. There were records of his um, slaves. They talked about how he treated them. Uh, you know, there are these stories about how he liked to play the violin and whistle men minuets. Um, he, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, that lax. He, you know, did want his slaves to produce. But when you compare his treatment to what other planters were doing, black and white, relatively speaking, it, it was better than most. Um, we, I used the history of uh, a historian at Monticello who looked at the records. One of the things that Jefferson did is that when he made records of his slaves, he grouped them by families. Not all slave owners did that. Uh, there is the record of one black slave owner, and I found an article in a journal that discussed how he kept records of his slaves. All he had was the first name and the age. It's like almost like livestock. Mm. Jefferson um, tried to keep people and he didn't call them slaves. He called them his servants because he didn't like the notion of slavery. Um, but he tried to keep people in family units when he, he was forced to sell slaves uh, because he was constantly struggling, uh, you know, financially. He tried to keep them in family units. So... Um, we, we can look back at those records and sort of get, get us a relative perspective of what he was like uh, at the time. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now, if we fast forward to now, okay, we, we see, you know, the 1619 Project permeating um, and many of our education systems today, particularly, obviously, in America, where it's most relevant. Uh, <sighs> 
what is something that is so blatantly false or destructively false that you believe that you... Yeah, what's something so destructively false being permeated through modern education systems uh, that you disagree with, that you'd want to illuminate here? Well, what's false is this pitting of whites against blacks and vice versa and inculcating young students with this notion that all white people are oppressors and that the white race uh, or people, you know, the light skin tone uh, are naturally enslavers and um, they need to walk around feeling guilty and that young children have to feel guilty. There have even been exposed these exercises in classrooms where um, they have skin tones and students are supposed to, you know, they have gradations of skin tones and they're supposed to identify themselves and then they're supposed to explore the characteristics of that group that has, you know, those skin tones. That is a such a toxic idea to put into the minds of young people. But it's actually something that, you know, was started when the Communist Party uh, established itself in New York City in 1919. So we, sh I think we should be. Uh, you know, recognizing that anniversary, the 100 year anniversary in 2019, because that's what Lenin told the people, the Americans in the Communist Party is to sort of, it, it was like a, a, you know, a sore point. There was discrimination, there were lynchings, but he said, exploit those points in American society um, so you can divide people, you can start a civil war, have, you know, one American against another and keep bringing this up. And there were very many ways that the communist tried to do this. They tried to introduce a, you know, black separatism, have, you know, 11 uh, Southern states become a black nation. They did that in the 1920s and 30s and 1960s. They've been trying to do that ever since and um and and that is you you know a civil war is how they operate that's how they gain power and that's how they destroy governments is by setting people against each other and i know from the history of my country you know where i was born in slovenia it was literally brother set against brother and you divide and conquer, and that is the goal. And we're seeing so much yeah. conflict. And you know, I'm sure you've you heard about all the riots last summer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, we did. And and it seems like a lot of that was driven from some of these ideas, uh, albeit false. It, it appears like, or at least a lot, are very misguided. Like, it it can get you down. I don't know if you ever just get a little pessimistic about the future uh i don't know of then what the next 50 to 100 years looks like or maybe you have a lot of optimism that we can kind of get through it um where do you sit like almost emotionally like how do you manage and how do we like manage all of the turmoil and conflict that is potentially being permeated by many of these uh, false ideas yeah, well, it, it seems very bleak um, these days. Uh, it's, you know, there's just so many things going on. And, you know, I was appalled at the riots last summer. I mean, literally in, in the city where I grew up, Rochester, New York, mm -hmm. you had Black Lives Matter people coming in mobs, overthrowing tables where people were sitting trying to eat dinner and screaming Black Lives Matter. Um, they were in the streets stopping traffic. Um, and the creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, when someone called these riots the 1619 riots, she took credit. She said, I'm very proud of that, of having inspired that. Uh, um, but uh, what we're also seeing here are these parents coming before school boards 
objecting to this toxic history and critical race theory being taught to kindergartners. And so we're seeing this public outcry. And back when I was teaching back in the 1990s, you know, and then up until 2013, I was very frustrated because I felt that the public needed to know what was going on. Because I was seeing this, I was seeing the multicultural math, the whiteness studies, the uh, you know the skewed history, um, the the propagandistic literature that was being taught, um, and I I was you know writing about it and you know almost shouting it from the housetops. At least that's the way it felt inside. You know, someone wake up, look at what they're doing. But now we're seeing it. People are fighting back. They're going to their school boards. They're getting involved. And, you know, I just try to do my little part. I try to correct the record. I try to fill in the gaps of the 1619 Project, tell the true history. And, uh, you know, overall, we are you know, a great nation. We have been the beacon of freedom. Uh, You know, America has been the beacon of freedom uh, for my relatives who came here and generations before of people that I've met, you know, when I was touring and talking about my Howard Zinn book, I remember I had this one Vietnamese woman come up to me and she gave me some currency of a Vietnamese, I don't know if it's a dollar bill or, or what they call it, but she was just so thankful because there are other people who know what it's like not to be free. And I'm hoping now that the you know American people en masse are waking up and um, you know not letting these bureaucrats and educrats and teachers get away with what they've been doing. I appreciate the uh, the work and the sentiment and the energy behind that. But do you think, you know, because I, born in Australia, obviously, I love this country. And, and thankfully, we don't have many of the same issues that Americans do. But also, we share a lot of similarities. And I love America. I've been a heap of times. And so I, that's, that's why my connection through this is, uh, I feel quite genuine. Um, but what do you think is the way through it? Like, do you think education, more awareness is the way through it? Or do you think there are other elements to this that are needed to provoke more significant change and awareness through our education systems? Well, I think, you know, I think just being aware of what's going on. um, I think it is... It's not only conservatives now that are objecting to this. Um, One of the editors at the New York Times named Barry Weiss, who was forced out. She is a gay woman, um, a leftist Democrat, uh, but she is starting to speak out against this censorship and this clamping down and this pitting of people by groups and races against each other. She sees how toxic it is. And there are others that are doing it as well. And so I think what we what we need to do is we need to affirm the First Amendment. That's the great thing about America, right? Um, I, you know, we do have the First Amendment and, you know, the founders in their wisdom, you know, put that in, freedom of speech. Uh, you know, that's why these tech giants clamping down is so scary. I mean, you know, as someone growing up in America, I just thought, you know, I can say whatever I want. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's so refreshing and yet it's, you know, taken for granted. Um, and we need to exercise that right and to insist on it that you know we we should be able to speak our minds especially when it comes to education to programs the taxpayers are supporting and i don't know if you've ever seen that iconic painting by norman rockwell you know back uh in the 1930s you know roosevelt talked about the four freedoms and you know of course we do have the freedom of speech but it's this 
is this picture of this working man in working man's clothes standing up at a meeting, at a community meeting, and speaking his mind. He's not, you know, a member of the elites. He's not rich. He's not in a fancy suit. But he's there, and he is a citizen, and he has as much right to speak as, you know, the millionaire um, or anyone else. That is a fundamental freedom. And, um, and I think we need to uh, return to that idea. And, and people just need to get out there. You know, the thing is, um, you know, people who are worried about these issues about education and indoctrination, they're the people that are working, you know, they, they have jobs. But as I've said before, we've reached a tipping point, they're going to these meetings, they're getting involved. Some of them are running for school boards. And we just have to insist that this history is not only toxic, but it's false, and it can be proven false. And it's uh, not based on real factual history. And just on that, while we kind of close up the conversation, um, when you say that, understand there might be some resistance to that, not based on actual real history. We've gone through some of the elements of, of why it's not, but uh, just to really kind of succinctly, the roots of the 1619 argument that Nicole Hannah-Jones talked about, um, can you just talk about briefly where she got a lot of her ideas from uh, from Lerone Bennett and then how Lerone Bennett, how he created kind of his uh, educational content, maybe you would call propaganda. Yeah, well, yes, she has an interesting history that um, she has shared uh, in various media platforms. Um, she is a biracial, she, uh, you know, is biracial. And apparently uh, she has some bitterness uh, over the experiences of her black father who never, you know, apparently she claims he was discriminated against in the army. Uh, her grandparents on her mother's side, she says, didn't accept, you know, uh, her father until the grandchildren came along. And uh, she was bused to a, a predominantly white school. And then she was introduced to this teacher in, I think it was 10th or 11th grade, a black studies teacher who gave out reading assignments of, you know, from Lerone Bennett. Lerone Bennett was not a historian. He was a propagandist. He was a writer for Ebony Magazine. And he wrote this book called Before the Mayflower, which talks about the, you know, uh, 1619 and the arrival of the first Africans, which of course is a fact that's been known through, you know, um, by blacks and is part of the history. Um, but Lerone Bennett, um, you know, made it into an issue, uh, put an ideological spin on it. Now, he also is the person who coined the phrase black power, which was then used by Stokely Carmichael. And so around 1965, 1966, we see the civil rights movement taking a shift to this notion of black power, of radicalism, and of anger, and of violence. So uh, that's where she was raised. She does, she, you know, I guess majored in history as an undergraduate, got her um, master's in journalism at UNC Chapel Hill, but really does not have training in history. She is unable to make distinctions between legitimate history and illegitimate history. And I really think she's sort of working out her own issues, um, her own anger. She seems to be a very hostile, angry person, refuses to get into conversations with anyone who doesn't literally worship her. Um, and so, you know, she is the least prepared um, or the least qualified to be putting together something that's being taught in the classrooms. Uh, yes, it is, right? That's, the clar that's to clarify that content that she's permeating is being taught in classrooms around America, correct? 
Absolutely. Um, you know, from the moment it hit the newsstands, it was into the schools, lesson plans, discussion questions, quizzes. Uh, she has appeared with the Pulitzer Center, which is a nonprofit, which is pushing this stuff of a for-profit, the New York Times, which is making money off of this into the classrooms. There are other there are other groups that are also collaborating. But here the Pulitzer Center is devising these, these ready-made materials for teachers. So teachers just love it, right? They don't have to do much. The kids get emotionally worked up. They start discussing it. Nicole Hannah-Jones has been in um, some of their workshops for teachers. She's uh, now started this after-school program um, called the 1619 Freedom Schools, um, you know, which is, you know, intended to radicalize uh, kids. So this is not someone who is either an educator or a historian or a scholar or anyone who is even open-minded or fair-minded as a journalist. She was corrected by the fact checker that was hired by the New York Times and ignored her, Leslie Harris, who specializes in African American history. So this is very deliberate. Um, Why? You what's know, the what agenda her... here? Like, what's the intent? Like, we don't all want to see each other suffer more and be persecuted more. Like, what do you think is the actual intent behind this? Well, she is a fa she's far left. She ha has uh, expressed her admiration for Fidel Castro's Cuba. She thinks that we should emulate that government. We should become more like that. She is espousing the views of the squad in the Democratic Party. She believes in socialized medicine, uh, reparations. She's come out uh, in favor of that, every issue uh, that's in the Democratic Party, that's in the left, which these days is almost synonymous, she is in favor of. And her goal is the black power goal, really. I mean, it boils down to, you know, that slogan that Lerone Bennett, her hero, came up with. So um, she, she wants to see um, black radicals come to dominance and to rule this country and to rule the world in their own kind of Marxist regime. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know really what to do with I, what I love is like now I want to speak to Hannah Jones. Like I'd love to hear her perspective on that or like I'd love to see you two talk together, right? Uh, do you ever envision that happening? Like, just to have a conversation. Well, actually, uh, an organization I belong to, the National Association of Scholars, and I point this out in my book, mm. uh, they've extended three invitations to her. Great. And she just has not replied. Um, oh. She refuses to engage in a debate. She shuts people down. She insults them. A reporter tried to get in contact with her. She doxed him. Um, she just throws okay. insults at people who disagree with her on Twitter and, um, you know, says it in newscasts. Um, she has called Carol Swain an accomplished, you know, black legal scholar, pol former political science professor. She's called her crazy. Um, you know, she, ju she just insults people. And, and puts them down and will not talk. So far, she has not talked to anyone who has criticized her or disagrees with her. Now, that, it, as, a, as a human being who needs to be a critical thinker, open-minded, be able to argue both sides, that, to me, is a very, that's a red flag. That's somebody who potentially is just seeking confirmation bias and maybe is partly afraid to be proven that something that they could believe may be incorrect or wrong. Yes. And um, unfortunately, you know, we used to in, uh, you know, back in the day, academics would have conferences, they would disagree, they would be corrected. 
Um, I tried to do that with my book. I had, uh, you know, the president of our, uh, you know, the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, Bob Paquette, who is an international, internationally known, award-winning uh, historian of slavery, check my work. Uh, he has given me incredible reading tips. We've had discussions. Uh, he, had, he had picked up some errors and I was just so grateful. And, uh, you know, I've had other colleagues who have given me feedback and I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to misrepresent someone or a fact in history. And I welcome the corrections. Um, you know, no matter, no matter, you know, what the, where the history leads, you know, what, uh, if it's good or bad, you want to be accurate as a scholar mm -hmm. and even as a journalist or as a writer. Absolutely. No, uh, no emotion, you, just like finding the closest thing to the truth. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and I do think, you know, at people who write history, and if you're looking at history, you have to have empathy right? You, you have to try to understand uh, the other person, put them, put yourself in, in their spot, but, but do it honestly, you know, uh, acknowledge the suffering of people who were enslaved, acknowledge the limitations of people who were born into a society where slavery was endemic and accepted. Um, and, you know, try to look at uh what happened in the past holistically mm -hmm. take take uh, you know a wider view of what happened. I think that's a great summary of, of how to become a more critical thinker. Mary, I think we could keep talking, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, do you have any last closing thoughts or just maybe maybe something profound that you've learned on this topic or a jewel that you've learned on this topic that you haven't spoken about yet before we close? Well, well, it's, it's been a great journey in terms of doing the research and um, because, you know, the, 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 this topic um, was something that I, you know, have come to uh, relatively recently and it just gives me an appreciation, more of an appreciation of how great America is. I always knew it. Um, you know, my parents talked about it. My relatives talked about it. I knew what it was like in comparison to a communist country, which I visited as a child. And, um, but I have acquired a more profound appreciation for um, the principles on which this country was founded and the progress that we've made. And, um, you know, as Abraham Lincoln said, it is the last best hope. And I hope through my book, um, you know, debunking the 1619 project, I can provide a resource for other people that they can use the research, uh, you know, that was so, so much fun for me to uncover um, and to explore and that they can use it in making their own arguments to keep, uh, you know, this country, the land of the free and have it be a beacon of hope for the world. Thank you, Mary. I love that little nice summary. I just have to pull on that little last string that you, what's the, what's that thing that's giving you the most optimism for the thing that you love about America and what, what it represents? Like what is, because it's still in you. I can hear it and see it. What is it? Like, can you describe it? What makes it like that and makes you feel like that? Well, it's, it's the American people. Okay. They are different. Um, there is this sense, you know, don't tread on me. Uh, that's part of the American character. You know, we, we don't want dictators. We don't want people telling us what to do. Um, I think there are, st you know, uh, so many Americans that feel that way and are willing to fight to keep it that way. Um, if you, if you travel to another part of the world, you see, you don't see that. And, um, you know, these are pe people generally, um, that are self-reliant, that help each other, uh, that value freedom are brave. And I 
think that that resilient American character or those traits, if you know, uh, we we need to we need to nurture those and use those to bring us out of this mess. <laughs> that you know that that the that though that those little dictators, <laughs> mm. they're little dictators. You know, they're in the they they may be at the head of the classroom or they may be in the principal's office or on the school board, but they they want they want to rule and control, and uh, you know we shouldn't let them. And I ho- I hope I can do my little part to to help that project along. I think you are, Mary. I think you are, and particularly on history and these really important topics and trying to bring some clarity and some high levels of evidence and truth around these topics. Thank you. Um, and lastly, like, where would you send people to buy the book? Can people listen to it on Audible yet? Are you planning to do that? Yes, they, uh, the publisher is Regnery. You can go to their website. You could buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, at my website, marygraybar.com, and I also have dissidentprof.com. I have a link where you can order it. It'll be in bookstores. It's coming out on September 7th, and it is in hardcover and um, on uh, you know, uh, audio, so you awesome. can listen to in your car, Great. and you know, so um, anywhere you can buy books, uh, you will be able to get it uh, as of September seventh. Beautiful, Mary Graber. Unless you got anything else, thank you so much for coming. Well, I just want to say thank you. Oh, hey, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure too. I'm glad we could connect from across the world and uh, bring some light to these yeah. topics. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Mary. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. We're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.